Thank you all for coming today. I'm going to talk about load testing. Um, load testing is, is an important topic. Performance is an important topic for all of our software systems. Just last week, my fiance tried to buy a Father's Day card from an online card store, Moonpig. I don't know if you have Moonpig here. It's big in the UK. Um, and she tried like for like half an hour and lots of spinning wheels while the website tried to load and didn't load and she couldn't browse for cards and she couldn't customize a card because the website was too slow. In the end, she did the unthinkable, at least for me. She got off the sofa, left the computer and went to an actual shop and bought a card from a real person, which I just can't even fathom. But she was driven away from a website because it was too slow. And this is a, this is a theme that we see at Skipjack a lot. Businesses are not performing as well as they can do because their applications are not performing as well as they can do. And the way you can fight this problem, one of the ways you can, you can <clears throat> prevent bad performance is to make sure that you're testing your systems to make sure that performance is adequate. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to talk about uh, sort of four main things, why you should bother in the first place. I've given you my little anecdote about moon pig, but we can get some data that, that kind of cements that a little bit. And then we'll talk about the three components of, of doing a load test. How you design a load test, something that might be new to many people, how to properly run a load test, and how to analyze the data you get back from a load test. In the wild, I see all three of these things done badly on a regular basis. If I see someone designing a load test rather than just making it up on the spot, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, but by the end of the day, we're all gonna be load testing pros. In my day job, I'm CEO at Skipjack, where we have built a platform for automatically optimizing the performance of your applications. So load testing is something we do a lot of and it's very close to my heart. In a, many years ago, I was co-founder of SpringSource and one of the Spring Framework creators. Um, nowadays, I very rarely get to write any code. Before we get into how, let's understand why. Why should you spend time? Why should you spend money? Why should your team members waste any time at all on load testing? It's the kind of question we should ask ourselves about any endeavor we take when we're, writing, when we're doing some coding or when we're doing some testing. I love this little slide um, because it kind of captures the essence of exactly why you should care about performance and why you should be load testing. This is the CTO of Trainline, the train ticket booking app. And they spent a bunch of time doing some performance optimization, doing some load tests. And they made their site faster by 300 milliseconds. And that year, customers spent an extra 8 million pounds, like $10 million. Um, I kind of defy anyone to come up with another lever that can move revenue in a company that much with such a little impact, 300 milliseconds. Apparently, that's how fast you blink when you blink your fastest. That was a blink, by the way, not some kind of weird twitch. Um, $10 million, it's crazy. Time really is money, and it really was Benjamin Franklin who said that, which I didn't believe at first, but is true. You build software systems, you uh, spend a ton of time testing them and making sure they work properly and making sure the features are correct. But how much time do we really put into performance? We've kind of been conditioned not to worry about performance. I'm sure we've all heard the quote, premature optimization is the root of all evil. That quote is the root of all evil. It is wrong. And that's because it's not the full quote. The full quote is that we shouldn't worry about minor efficiencies maybe 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Yeah, maybe we don't want to worry about nanoseconds here and there, but 300 milliseconds isn't a minor efficiency. It's $10 million of revenue. Instinctively, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room already knows this. You've all been to a website and been frustrated because it's slow. Faster is better. No one's been to a website and gone, that website was just too fast. <laughs> it's not for me. I'm never going to go again. And in fact, I think we've all been conditioned now by the best websites. Like, I love Amazon. I'm a real impulse buyer. I have Amazon Prime, and it's great. And I'm conditioned to expect that level of service to any website I go to. So when I go to a website which is slow compared to Amazon, I'm like, who 
you are these jokers. Same with Netflix, like I'm conditioned by what the best websites give me in terms of performance, and I expect that from everywhere else. And this better service, this be faster speed, better service, leads to improved conversion. People buy more from you if you serve your web pages to them faster, if your APIs run faster. People stay on your website longer if your website is fast. People don't, they come back more if your website is fast. You make more money from your audience if your website is fast. There are thousands of examples of this. I've just pulled out three here. Um, Shopzilla, five second latency reduction, 12% increased conversion, another one from Walmart. But an interesting one here is Mozilla. It's not just about money. It can affect other interesting statistics that you might care about. Mozilla did a 2.2 second reduction in latency, and they increased Firefox downloads by 15.4%. Um, that was back when 15.4% was a lot for Firefox downloads, not nowadays when competing against Chrome. So if you have a business, or you work for a business, and you care potentially about making money, or at least having money to pay salaries and so forth, you really should care about how fast your websites are running. Application performance has a huge impact on revenue. In fact, for a lot of the companies we talk to who are investing money in things like A-B testing, do I have a red button or a green button? How big should the text be? Where should it be on the page? They spend tons of money on that and tons of time, and they don't really get big returns. They should spend more money on performance, optimization and performance testing, and get big returns. The reason why this doesn't happen, though, is because actually all kinds of performance stuff is really hard. Load testing is hard. Optimization is harder still. Um, it's very time consuming. Who has the time these days? You know, gone are the days, I think, where you could say, yeah, we're releasing in like six months' time. Like, that's our release cycle. Weekly releases, daily releases, hourly releases. Amazon, a thousand releases an hour. Crazy. Um, you don't have the time, so you need to get smart about it. And load testing is an interesting one because it's not enough to do it as a one-off. It's a process. You're going to do it again and again and again, and there's a set of steps you have to go through. And it's this idea that actually load testing isn't a thing that you do once. It's something you do continuously. It's a continuous process. Just like unit testing, just like integration testing, just like acceptance testing, you should think about it the same way. You have to do it again and again and again. Because it's OK to know one day that your software performs well, but the next day the world has changed. You might have new features. You might have upgraded your version of Linux, or you might have fixed some security patches. You might have more users. Those users might behave differently. You need to keep testing, because the world around you changes all the time. I've got this cycle. And you can see I'm an artist in my spare time. Um, you have to start with a clear purpose. This is where it goes wrong for nearly everybody. The purpose is usually we're going to do a load test. That isn't a purpose. You have to have a, a goal in mind. Then you have to design some experiments to, to support that goal. And then you're going to do this like, cycle of running the test, analyzing the results, getting some rewards, doing it again and again and again. You kind of keep this cycle going. And eventually, there is some glory. There is some, some reward. It's worth investing time in design. Because you, that, that time you'll use for multiple test runs. You'll, you'll do a design, you'll spend a couple of days on it, and you'll get a good few runs out of that, maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of months, or whatever. But those runs will be good quality. And depending on how fast your code changes or your business changes, that will drive how fast you have to revisit your design. So how do we design a load test? What do I even mean by designing a load test? Um, well, first of all, what do I even mean by load test? It's not like you're going to run something in JUnit and it will just say, yes, your system is fast, or no, your system is not fast. It's not a pass-fail. Unlike all of the kinds of testing that you do, there is a qualitative aspect to this. You have to decide what's fast enough. You have to decide if there is a performance regression, is that regression serious enough to stop you putting that build into production, or do you want to go ahead with it anyway? It's not as easy to get pass-fail, pass-fail. You have to kind of think about what those results mean to you. I don't, like the, I don't like the term load test, but I haven't got a better one. But just understand that when I'm saying test, I'm not meaning pass-fail. 
What I want to do with my design is start by thinking about why am I testing, what questions do I want to answer, and then how am I going to go about doing that. This is like traditional experiment design. When you're doing this, you're a scientist. It's great. You can pretend, you can get a lab coat on and everything. Um, I definitely recommend the lab coat. What you're not doing is saying, let's just test our system with some arbitrary number of users and get some arbitrary measurements out of the end. You might do that if your manager has said to you, you must do a load test and you don't want to do a load test. That's the easiest way to do it, is just to do something. But if you really want to answer some questions, let's think about what some sensible questions are. And a good one to start with is, what latencies do I see when I have, say, 50 or 100 or 200 concurrent users? Then you can start to think about, what quality of service am I giving to my users? You'll probably know on your website if you have 50 people on there during peak hours or 100 people in peak hours or whatever. Figure out what kind of quality of service you can deliver. You can flip that round. How many concurrent users can I handle before my latency gets crazy? An interesting statistic is if you want to get peak conversions from your website, you have to have it in front of your users in 1.8 seconds. So you might want to say, how many concurrent users can I handle before latency exceeds 1.8 seconds? Because that would be a good, a good upper limit. And then lest you want to be one of those companies that just falls over at a brief wind or a, bit, a busy period, how many concurrent users can I handle before my system is saturated? Today, it was announced in the UK that Tesco, the supermarket, are just cancelling a whole bunch of home delivery food orders because their system is completely inundated and underwater. Nobody wants to be the guy who's telling their manager that, or you don't want to be the girl who's going to their boss and saying, yeah, sorry, we're just going to cancel a million dollars worth of orders today. Knowing this measurement is probably the most important one of all. When we talk about latency, though, what do I, what do I mean? Do I mean what? you see, or what you see, or what you see. Like, everyone who visits Amazon right now will get a different latency for the home page. What do I mean? Getting the right measurement for latency is critical, and it's really hard because most of the tools out there give you all the wrong measurements, and therefore will screw you over straight away. If ever you see a tool reporting average latency, don't use that tool, because that metric tells you nothing. In any standard system that you have, the average of the latency does not tell you what the typical user sees. It doesn't tell you even what the central tendency of the late latency is. It just tells you that there are some latencies that look like this. It's useless. The best thing you can do is measure percentiles way into the tail. 99th, 99.9th, 99.99th, like far, far into the tail. And there's a reason for this, because percentiles are confusing for system performance. You might think, well, there's a 1% chance that customers see something worse than the 99th percentile. And you'd be in good company because most people think that. Except customers make multiple requests. And each request you do has a 1% chance of seeing something in the 99th percentile, worse than the 99th percentile, but your aggregate chance gets bigger and bigger over time. In fact, Google showed that the average web page makes 42 requests images, CSS, so forth. So the average customer will see something worse than the 95th percentile on their first page load. These are the only measurements that matter, because these are what everybody is seeing. If you're not tuning for the tail, and you're not measuring to the tail, you're just like, kidding yourself. These measurements, average 50th percentile, will be tiny by definition. And you can trick yourself into believing that your system is fast, but it isn't. If you only have one measurement, max is very useful because it tells you what the worst scenario is and kind of bounds how bad things are. But it can be very susceptible to measurement error because you can never correct it downwards. So it's almost always better to get like 99.9, 99.99. If you can, if your system is kind of sophisticated enough, it's better to get all the data, take a big histogram, and see you know, what, what your quality of service is as a big picture. And we'll look at some histograms at the end to, to see what that looks like. This is, I did some performance tests to get some data for this talk, and this is kind of what the tail looks like. So you can see like, it's pretty sensible, even up until 
99.98. But then in the, in the far tail, the measurements get crazy. So nothing below 99.98 is worse than two and a half seconds, but the max is like 10 seconds. That tail is crazy. And because customers make multiple requests, they have ever more chance of seeing something that bad. They matter. So when we're doing this test, and we're going to make all these measurements, we're going to answer some questions, the reality is you're going to put a lot of effort in. It's going to take you some time. It's going to take, cost you some money. You probably want to try and answer as many questions as you can at once. So the best load test is designed to gather all the data that you can to answer all those questions in one go. I'm going to show you how that works. But the basic, in, the basic instinct, if you will, is to consider load testing as exploring your load curve. And the curve is, how do I perform as I have ever-increasing numbers of users? And it might look something like this, if you're very lucky. This is the number of concurrent users. As it increases, I expect the throughput to increase, but not linearly, because it's not a perfect system. It's eventually going to taper out. And I want to know what this shape looks like. In the real world, what you probably get is it goes up, and it starts to come back down again. There's a point of inflection where things get really bad. That's your saturation point. That's when your system is at absolute peak, and you shouldn't put any more users through it. So the first thing you need to start with is the test plan. This is the traffic you're going to send into your system to see how it performs. And I hate the word test plan, or the phrase test plan. To me, plan just conjures up the wrong, the wrong idea, the wrong, the wrong way of thinking. It's a test model. It's a description of your audience, of how they behave, in aggregate. And then you can play that forward in any number of ways you want. And what I mean by that is, if you think about a plan, it's very prescriptive. Hit the home page, then visit the checkout page, and then add this item to your basket, and then do this. It's kind of deterministic. Every virtual user that you play in your load testing tool, like JMeter or LoadRunner or something, looks the same, takes the same actions. I don't know about your business, but my business definitely doesn't look like that. No two customers are the same, frustratingly. Um, so you need something that captures those differences. And a test model, this idea of modeling rather than just planning, is you capture a description of the audience, and you capture the probabilities of people behaving in certain ways. And then when you play 100 virtual users or 200 virtual users, they all act like different kinds of users you see in the wild. Getting that right is critical. If you don't do this, all the numbers you get are wrong. If all you do is like some synthetic transaction again and again and again and again and again, it doesn't simulate the way your system is in the real world. So don't do this. Don't have get the home page, get the offices page, get the jobs page, get the team page, go back and do it again and again and again and again, and in parallel like with as many users as possible. If you see this, stop. Now is the time to, to revisit. This is definitely where load tests go to die. Um, but if you're doing this today, don't, don't be sad. Everyone's doing this today, because it's the way all the tooling in the market leads you to do these tests. Um, and then you put the system into production, and the, the test results don't bear any relevance whatsoever to what you saw in production. You're just like, oh, this is pointless. It's because the tests are not right. What you want is something like this. People start on the home page. This is from the Skipjack website. It's a, built, a very simple model. People start on the home page, and then 10% of them go to the offices page, 30% of them go to the team page, 25% go to the jobs page. And of those people who are on jobs, 5% of them come back to the home page, and they might go on again. Now, critically here, this is 40, 65% of people who come to the home page go on to do something else. The rest of the people just do nothing, because that also happens in the real world as well. People just come into the system and don't, don't proceed. You need to capture that as well. Each user is different. Remember that, because if you don't remember that, then you're not, you're not capturing real workload. Those probabilities that we saw here, they capture those differences. It's just a model of the aggregation, right? It's like, this is what my audience looks like in, in total. But something's not quite right with that original model, because I don't go to Amazon homepage and immediately add something to my cart and something else and something else and check out. I take my time to browse for which pointless gadget I'm going to buy today. 
And the same happens here. People have wait times. They wait at certain points, and they wait different times depending on where they're going. In the case of Skipjack website, I think the office's link is at the bottom of the page. So you've got to have scrolled all the way down. So maybe you wait longer for that than you do where the link is on the right, right at the top of the page. Wait times are a real thing. I've seen a great many, more than I care to ever admit, test plans from customers who don't have a wait time in there. Uh, not only are you not modeling your system accurately, the reality is that when you run the test plan, you're probably going to saturate the system straight away. And every measurement you get is called into question. Because when a system is saturated, latencies just grow infinitely. And you, you can't even rely on any measurements at that point. Um, you just have to, you have to get these wait times in there to make, people, to make the virtual users behave correctly. Some things about wait times, they're typically non-zero. It's rare for people to go from one thing to the other. They're not fixed. It's like every user waits 1,500 milliseconds before going from the home page to the jobs page. They're usually drawn from a distribution. There's some latency distribution for those wait times as well. And if you don't know what that distribution is, then something like exponential or log normal or some approximation of that can be added when you're trying to simulate how people might wait. Maybe it's an average of 1,500 milliseconds, but the spread looks like a certain, certain uh, distribution. And I'm going to show you how to code this up in a minute. The issue, of course, is um, this is a very simple model. And actually, the Skipjack website, whilst only having like, I don't know, 20 pages, the test model is way more complicated than this, because the number of paths that people take through the site is incredible. Um, you're not going to build it by hand. And you're certainly not going to maintain it by hand, because it's going to change. You know, as, P as you change your home page, or as you change your APIs, the systems interact with them in different ways. The probabilities change, the wait times change. You need a process by which you can keep it up to date automatically. And the best way to do that is to take data about production usage and use that to derive the model. Uh, we're working on tools for this, and we're building ever more. So we have tools that do this for Google Analytics right now and some log file tools. The idea being that you get the shell that says, these are the requests that users make. These are the rates with which they move from one page to the other, or one API endpoint to the other. And you can keep that maintained continuously based on real data. If you don't automate this, it will never be maintained. Any data you can get is, is good. Like If you've got some new relic data or some app dynamics data, then great. Or maybe you're using X-Ray from Amazon. Also great. Just something that tells you, this is what my users do. All the test plans I've shown, all the, all the, the diagrams I've shown so far have all been about get requests. Um, test plans get really hard when you're thinking about data mutation. Uh, but there are some simple design techniques um, that I found make design mutable tests much easier. So the first and most important thing is each test should start at the same point. So snapshot your starting data, run your test, and if you need to run another test, restore back to that snapshot. This is really easy in cloud environments. It takes like 20 minutes to take an RDS snapshot in AWS, and I assume the same for Google. Just snapshot some data. It's easy. The critical thing, though, is that you need to give your virtual users a real identity. And what I mean by that is when you say, OK, this system is ready for a new virtual user to start one of those journeys, you want to assign or generate test data in a consistent way for that virtual user. So you might even have like Rob Harrop as a virtual user, and Henry Brown as a virtual user, and Dominic as a virtual user. People like real data. We have a customer who uh, their system is, uh, they do online loans. I couldn't remember the word. And they have test data from their credit checking company. So you can use that test data to seed your, your virtual users. But each virtual user must have a consistent set of test data. And when you give virtual users an identity, it actually becomes really easy to model the mutation workflows, um, because that person can happily trundle through the whole flow having real data about themselves, data that you know is consistent. And it's not going to be Rob Harrop with Henry Brown at skipjack.com as an email address, just nonsense. It's all consistent. One of the interesting things when you look at designing these, these uh, these networks of, of test transitions is that mutation workflows actually modify the transition probabilities. And the easiest way to kind of think about this is what happens with sign up and sign in, or new versus old users. 
kind of the easiest example I can think of. So I come to the home page, and I can either sign in, because I might be an existing user, or I can sign up, because I might be a new user. I've got my email address, robertskipjar.com, I'm a password, correct horse battery staple, because I'm following the XKCD password naming conventions. Now, the problem here, of course, is I don't, this, this needs to either be a new user or an existing user right at the beginning, because you need to choose which path to take. If this is an existing email address for an existing user, then sign up won't work. So what you have is this sort of decision state where people transition with a probability again into being one user or the other. So right at the beginning, am I a new user? If yes, then I go to the sign up workflow. Sorry, am I a, am I a new user? No, 90% of the time, just sign in. Am I a new user? Yes, then sign up and sign in. You can do this for every branch that you have, every possible kind of customer, but obviously it gets, it gets pretty hard pretty quick to do by hand. So when you're trying to do mutable workflows, it's absolutely critical that you're generating this network from production data. What I want to show you now is how you can actually code that in JMeter because you, you don't get any help out of the, out of the box at all. Um, JMeter is quite painful. Um, I'm going to borrow, apparently no, no talk is complete without zooming in, like Josh Long does. So I totally figured out how to do that today. Um, it's quite simple. For each one of the states that I have, I've got like a named uh, sampler in, in JMeter. And this is a switch statement. And I'm basically going to switch based on some variable. It just has the name of the state in it. The problem with all this is there's no way of modeling those probabilities and those wait times naturally inside JMeter. So you have to drop down to code. Uh, but it's not, not all that hard. So what we do is each loop, we wait for some holding lambda, some holding rate. And then we enter this switch statement, switching on the state value. It just chooses either home, jobs, offices, team, or management. And all these are doing is sampling a get request, in this case, for management, and making some assertions. The assertions are really important, because you don't want to count error responses as real responses, because error responses tend to be really fast. So you might think, all of a sudden, your system's got incredibly quick, when in fact, actually, it's just not working. Um, always put a response assertion in there. But the real magic is in this, is in, the, is in this, uh, this coding here. I'm going to zoom out and zoom back in, closer on that. Uh, Got the hang of this now. Um, for anyone who's mathematically inclined, they might have realized that that little network of connections between the states kind of looks like a Markov chain, like a set of connected states, and there's a transition rate between the two. And this just captures that. And I don't want to get too much into the details of it, because I've put all the code on GitHub. But essentially, you have all the states as labels, and then you have, for each transition out of home in this row, for example, the probability. 20%, and the average wait time, six seconds. So home transitions to jobs with 20% in this case, to offices, 20%, to team, 10%, and these are the wait times. And all this code down here, which doesn't, the scroll doesn't work now because I've zoomed in, obviously, all this code in the bottom here is just boilerplate. All you need to do when you expand this is change the matrix. This is just looping through, finding which transition is next, setting the right, the right variables, go to this state, wait this amount of time, and away you go. It's painful that you can't do this uh, without using standard JMeter stuff, but you can write the code for it. Or in, uh, in very, very soon coming weeks and months, you can use the tools that we're building, which are free, to generate the test plans from your test data. We have our own little test plan language, which is in YAML, but we have an open source converter that converts it into a JMeter test plan like this that you'll be able to use. Um, much simpler way of doing it. Uh, the Skipjack website, which I say is like 20 pages, has 168 different states in that network and something like 400 different possible transitions. And we're not a huge company yet. So imagine if you're like Amazon trying to do this. It's not going to work by hand. Um, so on my GitHub, please feel free to, to browse through it. Once you've got that, you have to run the test. Um, Strange 
paradox of load testing is more people put more time into running the test than they do to the other parts, like designing and analyzing. Running the test is the easiest part. There's hardly anything you have to remember. The first thing is you need a good load testing environment. Then you need enough capacity to generate load. You need fast machines. Don't try and load test a cluster of 32 machines from your laptop or from you know, like a T2 micro in Amazon Web Services. That won't work. I mean, it should go without saying, but it doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, make sure you instrument the system you're testing. Nothing worse than running a load test for 12 hours. Going, it doesn't perform the way I thought it did. I wonder why. Oh, I've got no, no metrics. I don't know what the CPU usage was, or the memory usage was, or garbage collection. You've got to run the whole test again for another 12 hours. You need to collect system metrics immediately. And then just go do, do the run. The system under test isn't as hard as it, as it was these days. Um, if you're running in cloud, you're basically just cloning what you're running in cloud. You've probably already got some kind of pre-live or staging environment that's very close to production. Use that or use a copy of that. It's totally fine to, to, you know, to, 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 to just co to copy that as, as best you can. You will have to stub some things. We had a customer who was, um, they were using uh, Navitair or like Sabre, one of those like flight booking backends. You can't load test against that without paying a ton of money, so you have to stub out. That's fine. Just make sure your stubs are really good. There's a really good tool for this um, called Hoverfly. Um, if you've not seen this already, it's definitely worth getting. Uh, you can, it's totally open source, written in Go from the Specto Labs guys. Um, they have a way of designing like, virtualized versions of services that give real responses. We've been collaborating with them to make sure that those responses also exhibit the right wait times, because services you call to also take time and wait. Um, their office is around the corner from ours, so it's really easy to work with them. Please, if you only remember one thing from this talk, remember that laptops are not load generators. If you've got like Chrome running in the background with Netflix or whatever, and you're trying to generate load from your site, it's not, just don't do that. If you're ever in doubt, just over-provision, because you're not going to run those machines forever. You're going to run a load test for like six hours. So start more machines than you need, and after six hours, shut them down. It's probably cost you like 20 bucks. Don't worry about it, just over-provision. When it comes to instrumentation, um, I'd like to say you can never instrument too much, but the reality is you can easily gather a ton of useless data, and obviously you're paying the performance cost of gathering that data. So one approach is to use this methodology that I first encountered from Brendan Gregg, the guru of performance at Netflix. It's called Use, Usage, Saturation, and Errors. And the basic premise is that for every resource in your system, you gather a usage metric, a saturation metric, and an error metric. And at the end, you pretty much got all the data you need. If you haven't read already Systems Performance by Brendan Gregg, you must read it. It's the best book on performance there is. And in there, he has this table. I've totally stole this from his website. Um, this is the resources you have, CPU, memory, network, disk, and these are the kinds of things that you should track. So as a minimum, CPU percentage, obviously. Run queue length, that tells you how saturated your CPU is. Uh, are you getting any weird errors from like error correcting codes and so forth? Uh, free memory, page swapping and thread swapping, network throughput, I oh, don't need me to read those to you. But in each case, you've got a way of telling was this resource the bottleneck? Was it saturated? And where, was I seeing any errors? Capturing these, by the way, is how you sleep when you get weird bugs. Because when you get like a weird test result and you can't figure out what it is, if you can't immediately identify it's an error, that leads to hair pulling out, as you can see. Um, this is not natural. This is because I load test. Um, yeah, you need, you need those to just identify a bad test. Otherwise, you'll waste tons of time. That slide's in the wrong place, apologies for that. Um, you've already seen how to do this. You can implement this in any test tool. Maybe not natively, but any test tool that supports scripting, you can build a test model in the right way. But what do you do when you're running? You want to you um, answer all the questions we set at the beginning. You want to find out what quality of service you've got when your system's at various load levels. You want to find out how much load can you handle before the system uh, falls over. 
And the best way to do this is to measure from, from some incredibly tiny load that you know you can handle, like one user, all the way up to the point when the system falls over, to that saturation point. So the problem actually becomes detecting system saturation. And the first thing you can't do is you can't use any of those use metrics, really, to detect system saturation. Because your system can be saturated even before any of the resources become saturated. There might be like a weird code bug that you've got that just prevents the system from handling any more users. And ever more and more, some of those metrics are getting less useful. Like on modern computers, um, CPU utilization is not a great metric for CPU utilization. Um, because CPUs can be sitting there waiting for memory. Because memory is getting slower compared to CPU. Um, so like things like instructions per cycle and cycles per instruction, it's getting harder and harder to measure it. The best way to measure saturation is from the outside. As I increase my load, what's the relative increase in throughput that I get? And you're going to get that nice swoop. It's going to go up, 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 flatten out, and drop down. You can check this by hand. If you've taken a bunch of measurements at like 10 users, 20 users, 50 users, 100 users, you'll see when it sorts to get worse. You can plot these on a graph. You get really fancy and start doing curve fitting and calculus and stuff. I'll show you all these. This is the data I took. So I tested a staging version of skipjack.com with 30 users all the way up to 150 users. Um, this is how many requests I, got, I made in that time. This is the error rate. Always worth checking the error rate. I mean, these are tiny error rates. You're always going to get some errors. Like I was running this um, from one Amazon region to another Amazon region. You'll always get like, weird glitches in the network. But if you start to get whole percentages, then you really need to think something's gone wrong. The key, though, is like, what's the throughput? And you can see here that 120 users, the throughput is like 52 requests per second or 52 and a half requests per second. But 130 users, it's 48 requests per second. So things have gotten worse. So somewhere in between there is the maximum user load that skipjack.com can handle. I just realized I've given you all the recipe for dial of service for my website. It's like these, these are millions. You know, it's not 120 real users. If you plot this, you can you see it like immediately. It's, it's great. It creeps up, it creeps up, it creeps up. It starts to get worse, and then obviously, poof, and this just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse as you uh, as you load it. And the reason for that is more and more users just sit waiting in a queue somewhere. Be it the run queue for CPU, be it the network queue, be it the memory queue, be it some queue in Java, they're waiting somewhere. You just don't know where yet. There's a rule for this. It's called the Universal Scalability Law. It was, uh, I don't know if the, the word discovered is the right word, but it was shown to us by the prophet Neil Gunther. Um, it's really simple. You have two kinds of overhead, contention and crosstalk. Contention serves to, to give you the upper limit on how fast your system can go, and crosstalk makes things worse. Like at a certain number of users, performance starts to go down. You can think about crosstalk as things like if you've got a Cassandra cluster, for example, and they're all trying to agree on a transaction, the more servers you add that all have to agree, obviously the bigger the overhead comes. But one that you might not think of, and actually happens a lot in real world, is the overhead of memory on two different processors trying to synchronize. A weird thing we see when doing load testing and optimizing with customers is that as you increase the instance size of a system in Amazon, performance starts to get worse. And that's because the customer's never written their application with multi-CPU in mind. And in multi-CPU systems today, memory is local to each CPU. And if you've not written with memory locality in mind, it's really easy for memory sync overhead to just completely uh, end up being this crosstalk overhead that, you, that, that kills your performance. The reason this is important is we can fit this curve to our data, and we can make some predictions about it. So you needn't have done 100, uh, 110. To 150, so you need like 12 or 15 data points like I did. You can do three or four, start to fit this curve, and you can start to discover where it happens. But using the curve and then taking the derivative of the curve, and when it gets to negative, you can find pretty much the exact predicted uh, saturation point, which I think is 126 users. And if you want to like, narrow down on that, you can start to do some more fine grained tests. Frankly, I treat the saturation point of Skipjack around about 90, because you don't want to be 
the day before you're about to hit 120 users starting to provision new capacity, do that a few weeks beforehand. It only took me, I don't know, four hours to run these tests. I ran them all in parallel. Um, so I, I spun up like eight different copies of the Skipjack website, all identical to production, and then ran the tests in parallel. Like four hours later, I had all the data. Um, like I said, I'm not much of a coder anymore, so I just sort of hacked this together in Bash, and it kind of hung together pretty well. And then you identify this, as I showed you before, that somewhere in between here, 120 and 130, is the saturation point. And now we can answer some really good questions. We know, for example, that um, the average number of users on Skipjack at peak times is 40. Um, so we can start to figure out how fast they go. We know we can figure out how fast they're going to go when that doubles. Let's see what that looks like. This is the analysis. Step zero in all analysis is to learn to program in R. I'm a real R snob. I don't apologize for this. I suppose you could use Python if that's your kind of thing. But really, you should be using R, because I said so. And all you're going to do is two simple things. Do some exploratory analysis. People seem to skip this step. Like they'll, they'll go straight to trying to answer the questions, missing all the riches. Your data tells you so much about your system. Explore that data. Do some exploratory analysis. And then finally, answer your questions. And if you have the chance, if you're involved this closely in your business, it's nice to try and link this up to production data. What I mean by that is to say, if you know, for example, how performance impacts conversion in your business, you can learn important things like if our user, um, if the number of concurrent users in our system doubles, our conversion will actually drop by 2%. One of the things we're hoping to do in our test plan generator is actually tell you that those statistics automatically. But you can, you can calculate that. The best, normally, the best visualization you can do is a histogram. Uh, the problem with skipjack.com for a histogram is it's just so damn fast. So most of it sits in this tiny little bucket of really fast, and only a few requests are really, really slow. Most systems are a bit more um, bumpy than this, so the histogram starts to tell you a little bit about how they perform. Um, but you can transform that into a log scale if you've got that weird, that weird thing, and this is really more useful because it tells me there are some really fast requests, some kind of fast requests, and then very few slow requests. And if you dig into the code a bit, you can kind of figure out that these, in this case, were requests served from cache, requests not served from cache, and requests that got hit during GC pauses. Um, it's pretty useful. And that tends to be the pattern you see for most applications in Java, by the way. Um, the GC just kills you. One thing that's nice is to figure out what that looks like per endpoint. So not just for the whole system, but you can facet it down. So home, obviously, is the one we hit the most. And it's nice to see that the vast majority of um, requests in home are in that, that fast chunk. The time series is really useful. And this is how I find out about the GC thing. So what instead here is we've got, for a whole test at a whole load level, this is the time elapsed. And this is the measured latency for every point. And these big points here correlate really well with GC pauses. Um, and that's because I recorded also in my system metrics how long and how much GC time was being spent. Um, it's probably a truism, as everyone knows it, but if you're coding in Java, your main optimization thing is to not have to GC all the time. If you're having trouble tuning your GC, come and talk to me. We have a machine for that. It does it really well. Um, we recently made a system faster by 27 seconds on the 95th percentile because we were able to completely eradicate GC for all these crazy GC spikes. Um, as strange as it sounds, though, all these fancy graphs, the table is just the best visualization you can come up with. So I like to take a nice table that shows me the median response times and then the, um, the, the 90th, 95th, 99th, and 99.9th. This is at the saturation point, I think, or the, the, the common load level. And I'm happy with most of these times. Like, these are all under the 1.8 seconds. I'm not so happy about this one, though. Um, and the weird thing about this is, this is the only endpoint in Skipjack that's actually loading any data from a database. So you can sort of see where that weirdness starts to creep in, that maybe that we got some slow queries in the database, or we got some network jitter, or whatever. You can start to see like, what happens when you segment it down by endpoint. This is super useful, segmenting it by load level, because this answers all the questions you were asking before. 
what kind of quality of service do I give at the common? So in, the case of, in our case, 40. At saturation point, and also like how far can I go before things get terrible? So we can pretty much go all the way up to 120, and latency's still pretty good for us. We're not worrying too much there. The moment we go to 130, though, latencies get terrible, and people stop buying from us, which is terrible for me. Um, all this data was created from the CSV output from JMeter. It was maybe 60 lines of R code to put these tables and the associated graphs together. This is why you should learn R. Um, all of it's on my GitHub as well, so you'll see all the code there. And you can keep doing it. Like we did it by label as well, so is it by home or by jobs or offices or whatever. You can keep going. The danger is you can keep going forever, because there's always some more analysis you can do. But eventually, you'll start to answer those questions that you care about, and you'll get a good instinct for your system. Comparing the plots over time is also really useful, because one thing you can start to see is whether or not this starts to shift this way or this way. So is the system getting faster or slower? The graphical comparison typically is the easiest way to see if your system's getting faster or slower. It's hard to do on the numbers, unless you're really good at stats. You have to experiment with these different visualizations. You, you, it's hard to find the right one straight out of the gate. Um, it maybe took me an hour to try a bunch of different plots, find out which ones really kind of gave me the answer I wanted to do, gave me the insights I wanted to do. And we find that different ones work for different customers. Um, but always you'll find some kind of histogram, some kind of table, maybe a log scale histogram, a time series, will definitely give you good insights into your, into your system. So to summarize them, always load test with a purpose. Don't just load test because you've got a load test. I know we've all done that. I mean, I, it's sort of embarrassing sometimes that I'm now like a professional at this and how many years I spent being a complete amateur and pretend like fake load tester. Um, but always have a purpose in mind or just don't bother because you're just wasting time. Always get real user models. The tooling in this area is getting better. We're not the only company in this space. Um, you can always, uh, at least today, there's always a way of sourcing data to build a model. And I think in the next year or two years, you'll see a lot more solutions that actually build those models for you. Certainly, we're going to be doing that. I don't think we'll be the only people. Um, it really is the only way to get a proper load test, because otherwise, the numbers are silly. Do the load curve exploration. Don't just, don't just Go to loader.io or blaze meter and say, hey guys, like, tell me how my system performs with 50 users for an hour. Because that doesn't tell you what you want to know. You want to know all those load levels. Find out how your system ticks. And then always try and bring that back into real data. What's the impact of that slowdown on my conversion rate? What's the impact of that slowdown on my bounce rate? I don't think it's acceptable anymore for developers, especially of website properties or of any kind of interactive system to be kept away from the real user metrics, because how else can you best choose how to spend your time and choose how to optimize if you're not understanding what, the, what impacts the user the most? The slowest part of the code isn't always the code to optimize. You want to optimize the bit that really impacts the user. But if you remember nothing else, apart from don't use laptops for load testing, it's that performance matters. I have a, a little phrase I like to say when I'm trying to make profound statements. Application performance is business performance. Your business is not performing as well as it could if your applications are not performing as well as they could. Thank you very much.